Hey guys welcome back to our channel. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was son of Nyx, all element mastery. This is part 1 and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe. Also check it out link tree in description. Let get in the video. Sasuke. Called out a well built young man, with no sign of fat on his body. He had cerulean blue eyes and bright spiky blonde hair with red streaks. He had an angular face with three distinctive whisker marks on both sides. His cloths consisted of a black armor vest. Underneath the vest was a black short-sleeved shirt, black cargo pants with a leaf symbol belt buckle, and combat boots. The young man turned around, showing the black markings covering the right side of his face. So it's you Naruto, Sasuke said with an impassive voice, looking at him curiously. What's with the wardrobe change, dope? He asked, remembering that Naruto used to wear an orange jumpsuit. Naruto Uzumaki is a genin of Kanahagakure no Sado, or village hidden in the leaves. He is also the Jinch Kriki of the QB no Yoko, or the Nine-Tailed Fox Demon, a beast powerful enough that with just one swipe of its tails, it can cause natural disasters, such as tsunamis or tornadoes. The fox was sealed in him when he was a newborn by the fourth Hokage, the leader of his village, on October 10th. As his dying wish, the fourth asked for Naruto to be viewed as a hero who saved the village by containing the QB, but sadly it was not meant to be. Instead the people viewed Naruto as the demon, reborn into human skin, powerless and weak. So in their hatred they hunted Naruto down. In his childhood, Naruto experienced hell. He was hunted down like a wild animal by an angry mob, aiming to torture him before killing him. Throughout his childhood Naruto was beaten to a bloody pulp, stabbed, slashed with rusty objects, burned, and marked with a branding iron. One burn on his chest read demon and the other on his back that read QB. He was even poisoned to a point where he built up immunity, and finally, he was drowned. All his wounds healed thanks to the nine-tailed fox, but the damage had already been done with his innocence and childhood lost. It was only through those beatings that Naruto found out he was a jinch cricky. The only question he could ask was, why him? Why did the fourth Hokage choose him to live this life of hell? Naruto even asked the third Hokage, someone who he used to view as a surrogate grandfather. But the only answer he would get is that he didn't know. So, imagine the shock and betrayal he felt when he had to find out from the people who were torturing and trying to kill him. The blonde wanted nothing more than to lash out and seek revenge, to make all those people suffer as they did him throughout his life. But the blonde realized that it wouldn't matter. He couldn't get back the childhood he lost. He was forced to mature. He couldn't get back all those lonely nights of him sleeping in the harsh land or the food he was forced to eat, such as rats, rotten food, and other things he had to salvage just so he could survive. It was all lost to him and he couldn't get it back. So instead, he embraced his hatred, his suffering, his anger, his darkness, and even his curse. He embraced all of it and used it as a sort of motivation to make himself strong, instead of stooping to their level of ignorance and mindless revenge, along with protecting those who he considered his friends, people who cared for him when he was a child. The perfect example was Lilith, also known as Mother Superior. She, along with people she trusted, owned the major brothels, strip clubs and other business establishments in the red light, where Naruto lived the vast majority of his life. She has long brown hair, green pupil-less eyes, DD cup breasts, tan skin, a heart-shaped face, a perfect hergless figure, and she would usually be seen wearing her black kimono with a dark blue flowering design, blue thigh high heels modified to store a hidden knife and holster several senmen. She was after all a former anbu, which were considered the elite warriors of a hidden village. She, along with her girls, would always hide Naruto from mobs and would always help him. This, at the least, made Naruto's life bearable. And it wasn't just her or her employees. Everyone in the red light saw Naruto as a hero and not the demon reborn. Most were former shinobi. They could tell the difference between a storage scroll and a kunai, unlike some of the villagers who saw Naruto as a demon and unwanted material. It was the 10th of October when the blonde and them first met. Naruto was being chased by a murderous and angry mob. That's when Naruto bumped into her. She instantly recognized him from her sources and felt a huge amount of anger at the mob that for trying to kill him, so she hid him in her main brothel the Heavenly Leaf. Ever since then, Naruto would come and hide there, and Lilith and her girls would always hide him, considering all her girls saw him as their little brother or the older girls would see Naruto as a son. It was also worth mentioning that Lilith took great care of her girls, making sure they were safe and healthy, even in that kind of profession. Naruto respected them, regardless of their profession, and still saw them as equals, looking past what society thinks of his sisters and motherly figures or the people of the red light, though he knew they could handle themselves as a majority of them were former shinobi and kinoichi. Naruto ignored the Ichiha's question and insult. Instead he had his own question for the Ichiha heir. You're really going through with this aren't you, he asked, though it wasn't really a question. Naruto knew that Depp Sasuke would go to in order to gain more power. 
You're really going to that traitorous snake bastard for power. Sasuke nodded, he needed this power to kill his brother, the person responsible for killing his entire clan and their parents. He was also pampered by the civilian council, the people responsible for most of Naruto hellish ordeal. Also they could get favors and elevate themselves through the delusional and revenge-driven Ichiha. The blonde sighed. Idiot doesn't know anything about what his brother did. Naruto knew the truth behind that fateful day, the Ichiha massacre, but Itachi Ichiha made him promise to keep it a secret. Then I have no other choice. By order of the Hokage, I hereby place you under arrest for treason, Naruto stated, shocking the dark-haired teen, before suddenly laughing. And who's going to bring me in, you? Please, dope. You're dead last in the academy. How can you bring me, who was dubbed rookie of the year and top of our class, in? Huh, Dobe Sasuke said in a mocking voice. He felt insulted. He thought they would at least send someone stronger than. The duck-ass-haired teen was suddenly and abruptly broken from his thoughts when he felt a fist collide with his face and a hand grabbing the collar of his shirt. Before the Achiha knew it, he was underwater. This all happened within a fraction of a second. The hell he thought in disbelief. Sasuke swam up to the surface and channeled his chakra to his hands to lift himself up from the water. He did the same thing to his feet so he could stand on the surface of the water. But team, you look dazed. The last loyal Ichiha look up to see Naruto standing casually on top of the water. I didn't even see him move. No, it was only a lucky shot he thought. You could surrender and save me the trouble of having to drag your pampered ass back to Konoha, Naruto offered, causing Sasuke shake in sheer anger. How dare this this commoner trash underestimate him, a noble Ichiha. He'll make him pay. With that thought in mind, Sasuke charged at the blonde with murderous intent. The blonde sighed tiredly and muttered, I tried reasoning, before easily sidestepping Sasuke's attack and kicking the Achiha up into the air. Naruto quickly leaped upward, not giving Sasuke time to react. The bond kicked downward, sending the Achiha hurtling straight to the cold water. The duck ass never even touched the surface, as Naruto kicked him again sending him to the right, and then he kicked him again, this time to the upper left. Hope you can swim after this, Naruto said, grabbing Sasuke from behind, and pile drive him straight into the water while rotating at a ferocious speed. He let go of Sasuke at the last possible second, before said teen dropped into the water. The blonde felt a bit of strain in his muscles and slightly dizzy, but other than, suddenly, his opponent jumped out of the water, going through the necessary hand seals before shouting. Katen. Nkakak no jutsu fire release. Great fireball technique. Sasuke fired a massive orb of roaring flames straight at his former teammate. The blonde remained calm and did a one-handed seal. Suiten. Sujinheki water release. Water formation wall. Naruto used the technique to create a wall of water to block and dissipate Sasuke's technique. Naruto didn't have an affinity for water techniques, but it didn't mean he couldn't use them. Using different affinities, other than your own, takes up a lot of chakra, luckily for Naruto, he had nearly endless chakra reserves. The two jutsu collided, creating a blanket of steam. This didn't bother Naruto in the slightest. Thanks to his ability to sense people's energy and emotions, the blonde didn't need to see where his opponent is. The same thing cannot be said about Sasuke. Since he wasn't a sensory type like Naruto, he couldn't see where his opponent was. And, in a battle, that can be a death sentence. Dawn. Repchum wind release. Gale palm. Rather than clapping his hands together, Naruto manipulate the hot steam to create a powerful gale. Shit, Sasuke cursed. Knowing he had no chance of evading, he did his best to defend against the attack. The last loyal Ichiha screamed in pain, feeling his skin being burned by the hot air, before he was then slammed into the ground. If it up Sasuke, you stand no chance against me. Sasuke glared at Naruto with anger and hatred in his eyes. The Ichiha hated the fact that this no-name orphan was basically kicking his ass without so much as breaking a sweat. How can he be stronger than me, he's the fucking class clown and the dead last. Sasuke wondered. Naruto was the one who failed to graduate three times and was at the bottom of the class. So he shouldn't be dominating this battle, it should be himself. He was an Ichiha, top of his class, a prodigy. He was the heir to the most prestigious clan, he. You must be wondering how I'm dominating you in this fight. Due to his shock Sasuke, could only nod to Naruto's words. One word Sasuke, just one word, the dark-haired teen heard him say. Deception. That single word rang in the mind of Sasuke Ichiha, and it confused him to no end, which Naruto saw. I see, even in your pained state, you are confused. Well let me enlighten you. Naruto said. Then, in a blink of an eye, the blonde was standing in front of Sasuke and crouching. He looked into Sasuke's onyx-colored eyes with his cerulean blue eyes. Deception is the bread and butter of a ninja, something that most, if not all, have forgotten. I, on the other hand, use this fact to deceive everyone into believing that I was weak. By becoming the class clown and the dead last, it worked. 
Not even the third Hokage, the so-called professor, figured out I was wearing a mask and hiding my true skills. So, you see Sasuke, I'm stronger than you and most Jonin. Hell, if I remove certain restriction seals, then I could practically match that snake bastard. Now let's try this again shall we? Naruto stopped for a bit, and his gaze turned deadly cold. Would you kindly give up? Something inside Sasuke snapped. The thought of Naruto being stronger than him did it. Sasuke couldn't accept the mere thought of it. How could he? Sasuke was given everything he asked for to become strong from those in the civilian council. Dark purple chakra suddenly burst out of Sasuke's body, causing Naruto to jump back and away from the Acha. So he tapped into the power of the curse seal. This should be interesting. The curse seal, which was created by Orochimaru, the person Sasuke was planning to join to gain more power, was a seal that increased the user's chakra levels and physical capabilities, while the seal is active. Once branded, the person had a 1 in 10 chance of survival. If they do survive they would become host bodies for Orochimaru to use when he needed a new one for his ambition of immortality. Orochimaru is able to do this due to the seal containing a part of him to inhabit the host body, slowly preparing him or her for the transfer. Naruto could only shudder thinking of that gay pedophile inside of Sasuke. That is just wrong on so many levels. He grimaced at the mere thought of it and, in all honesty, almost hurled. Naruto pushed those thoughts back into the deepest corner of his mind and turned his attention back to the Achiha, who was slowly standing up. From the looks of it, the black markings were spreading over his entire body. This must be the second level Anko told me about Naruto thought. Sasuke's skin turned dark gray, his hair grew and turned dark blue. His eyes also turned dark gray with the Sharingan active. Additionally, he grew webbed claw-shaped wings from his back, and a dark, star-shaped mark appeared across the bridge of his nose. I'm going to kill you, Sasuke said with a dark demented voice, before he flew straight at Naruto with extraordinary speeds, thanks to the curse seal. The blonde simply sighed and met Sasuke halfway, matching the Ichiha's speed with his own. The two fought for supremacy. Sasuke would attack the blonde with ferocious strikes, using everything from his hands and legs to those wings of his. The blonde would dodge or block all his attacks like he was predicting Sasuke's every movement, which he actually was. Naruto had the keen ability to predict and anticipate his opponent's movement, based on the muscle movement of the body down to the last millisecond. He could then choose to block, dodge, or counter the attack. So this is all the curse seal can do? Naruto taunted, dodging a roundhouse kick and blocking a second kick. He then grabbed Sasuke's leg and tossed him into the large statue depicting Hashirama Senju, founder of Konoha and the first Hokage. Naruto himself jumped on top of Madara Ichiha, founder of the Ichiha clan and Hashirama's greatest rival. The Valley of the End. Heh, fitting place since your ambitions are about to come to an end. Naruto said in a calming tone before he saw Sasuke charging up his Shidori. The blonde expected to hear a distinct chirping noise that is normally associated with the 1000 bird technique. Instead, Naruto heard the sound of flapping wings, and the color of the Chidori had a rather dark gleam, instead of its normally bright blue hue. Naruto took a small breath of air and concentrated on calling out the nine-tailed fox's chakra. Suddenly Crimson Chakra began to dance around Naruto, and his features became more feral as the energy began to surround him like a blanket. The blonde Jinch Kriki held his right hand up, and a swirling ball of pure chakra began to form. Naruto concentrated the fox's chakra into the yellowish-blue ball, and, slowly, the color shifted to a more purple, orange, and red color. Let's end this dope. Gladly team. Both shinobi flung themselves into the air at each other, with their attacks colliding. Abataku Chidori flapping 1000 birds. Shui Rasengan Vermilion Spiraling Sphere. The energies combined around the two former teammates, creating a large sphere of pure energy around them. Suddenly there was a flash of light and a massive explosion of pure power, and Naruto could be seen standing tall, while Sasuke was on the ground unconscious. You should have given up. This wouldn't have happened and you would still have your right heart. Naruto stumbled and felt a familiar sensation of cold steel burrowing into his flesh. The blonde turned around with anger in his eyes. Kakashi Haddock, Naruto spat with venom in his voice. Removing the knife, Naruto suddenly fell to his knees and felt his insides burning. Hello demon. I can see you're feeling the effects of the quick-acting poison I laced that kunai with, Naruto's traitorous teacher said with glee. The blonde looked up with fading eyes as the poison was quickly spreading through his body as he struggled to get back up. Damn it Naruto mentally cursed as he felt his pulse fading away. Try as he might, he couldn't even defend himself as he stumbled to the ground. With hazy vision, Naruto could see Kakashi about to finish him off until something from the shadows suddenly sprang up. It was too fast for his traitorous teacher to react as it cut Kakashi in half. The last thing he saw was a woman wearing a black hooded cloak. He could distinctively hear her say something, but couldn't make out what since his consciousness was slowly fading. Unknown Pav. 
I decided to visit the elemental nations and check up on my son. My mortal shell was destroyed when it was stabbed by a massive claw, courtesy of the QB, whose power could be equal to that of Typhoon. I felt weak and I had no choice but to recover my power back in my dimension, but in doing so I left my son, Naruto. As a goddess, I can travel from dimension to dimension. I chose the elemental nations, a warring world that had enough conflict to make Ares drill. As a rule in going to different dimensions, I have to take up a mortal body and have my memories sealed, for a time. In those years, I never would have thought that I, will my mortal self, would fall in love with a woman named Kishina Yuzumaki. But the intriguing thing about Kishina was that she was a demigod, and to my surprise, the daughter of Hestia. Though I sensed that she wasn't born by natural means, I deduced that she was born similar to how Athena would bear children. But that was only after my mortal body was destroyed. Ah yes Kishina Yuzumaki, heiress of the Yuzumaki clan, a clan that was considered one of the best sword users and had mastery over seals, whose bloodline gave them incredibly strong life force which can both endure and survive most grievous injuries plus incredible longevity. The clan members are also blessed with great recuperative powers, able to quickly recover from extreme exhaustion and mend most injuries in short periods of time. They also value the bonds of friendship and, more importantly, family. This could be why Hestia would have a child with one of them. Another thing I noted is that Kashina was also a legacy of Aphrodite, though I am not surprised by this, considering how beautiful Kashina was. From her long flowing blood-red silk-like hair, violet eyes, milky white skin, and her luscious curves down to her firmy bust and firm rear. Truly if I didn't know any better I would say Kashina was a daughter of the goddess of love, not the hearth. But to be honest the Yuzumakis were a clan of demigods. My mortal body was able to trace back each Yuzumaki up to the first Yuzumaki. Though I wasn't surprised by this fact, it made sense. Such as the swords they use, and Yuzumaki sword was known to be the best in the entire elemental nation. The swords were light as a feather, able to cut through the toughest metal or cleave a person in half, and extremely durable. Truly Hephaestus would have been proud of such weapons. The Yuzumaki clan was also known for their agricultural skills, known to be great farmers. Considering how small their island was, they were still able to grow an abundance of rice, vegetables, and fruits. The system of law was also advanced compared to the rest of the elemental nations. Demeter would be proud of them. They did well for their trading, though it was hard due to the fact that only an Yuzumaki could navigate over the vast whirlpools that surrounded the village. After all, it is called Yuzushi Agakur, the village hidden by whirling tides, and this is where Poseidon comes into the clan's relations. They were also known to be great hunters, well there was a squad of just female hunters, and their anbu was founded by a female. There was equality within their clan for both male and female. A perfect example was their Yuzuka Gay who was female and the first container for the QB, Mito Yuzumaki. I have doubts that Artemis wouldn't have smiled at that. As far as ninjas go, they were known to be the best retrieval teams in the elemental nations. Able to steal information without anyone knowing about it and their merchants were all best in the business, this is why their clan was known to be the richest clan, a definite relation to Hermes. Their theaters were known to be the most entertaining, given how talented they were with music and poetry, as well as their marvelous works of art. I can see the relation to both Dionysus and Apollo. Oh, I remember the Yuzumaki clan was known for their pranks, and if you are on the receiving end, well you can say goodbye to your sanity, because an Yuzumaki prank was considered a maddening experience, and only a lucky few have kept their sanity intact, very few. In battle, the clan was known for their fierce reputation to a point that all ninjas under the clan were all ASS rank. This was because of their abnormal chakra, allowing them to manifest golden chains from their body which they could manipulate to their will in battle. The prime example of this was Kashina, also known as the Akai Chishio no Habanero Red Hot-Blooded Habanero, due to her fierceness in battle, and the last thing her enemies would see was her luscious blood-red hair. Kashina was able to control her chakra chains to a degree that they could deflect almost all attacks, and she could easily subdue anyone including the Biju, which I can compare to the Titans, such as the QB Witch, who was regarded as the strongest Biju and her former tenant. I am proud to say that a rank was SS rank with a flea on side order, meaning do not engage in combat. The S. Ares would have truly been proud of this clan. Now aside from their reputation in battle, the seals they made were all legendary, an example was a storage scroll. This scroll was made to store any and all items by creating a pocket dimension, meaning an Yuzumaki can literally create their own dimension using seals, yes this is where Athena's relation to the clan comes in. Another seal, known for sealing Biju, was the Shaikif Jin dead demon consuming seal, a seal only made possible due to the connection and relation to Hades a seal that is able to consume an enemy's soul. But it is also a double-edged sword, at least for a non-Yuzumaki, as the seal would also consume the user's soul. 
Now when my mortal shell traced the clan to the first Yuzumaki, it discovered that she was the wife of the Sage of Six Paths. In the elemental nations, he was considered a god, and she was the daughter of both Zeus and Hera. I guess that, like me and the rest of the gods and goddesses, both of them took a vacation here in the elemental nation and had a child, but since they took up a mortal body, the child was a demigoddess. My mortal shell couldn't find her name, due to the fact that the Yuzumaki clan was wiped out by the combined might of three of the five major villages. I suspected it was due to the fact that those villages grew jealous of the clan's rise to power, and they felt threatened by them. These villages were, or the village hidden by clouds, Iwagakura, or the village hidden by rocks, and Kurigakur, more infamously known as the village of the bloody mist. Though I suspected someone in Kanoha also had a hand in this, since the sealed barrier protecting the village was reportedly destroyed, and I know that no one in the clan would ever betray their own, so it had to be someone in Kanoha. But since my mortal body was destroyed, I wasn't able to find out who was responsible for it. From what Kishina told me, which was told to her by Mito, it nearly cost each of the villages involved all of their shinobi and kinoichi, since it took ten squads to eliminate a single Yuzumaki, and the Izukage was able to wipe out half of the army on her own. The clan fraud hard until only the Izukage remained. But in the end, she too fell while Kanoha wasn't able to reach them in time, but that was only on paper. In the actual reports my mortal shell found, Kanoha didn't know about the attack until after it occurred, which didn't make sense as the clan would have sent a messenger bird. My mortal shell suspected that it was intercepted or it did reach the village, but was never delivered to the third Hokage. To my knowledge only Kishina, being in Kanoha already, and Mido, since she was married to the first Hokage, were the only two survivors. When she heard this, she was devastated by the news. But to my shock and admiration she remained strong, stating that, even if our country is gone and our people wiped out, so long as there is one Yuzumaki who carries our beliefs that the bond of family runs deeper than the village itself, then the clan can rebuild. Unlike Kanoha, who preach about how you should give your life for the village, the Yuzumaki believed that family and its people were what matters, not the village. I remember what she added, our home is where our heart is, it is not just some place, but where our bond is at its strongest. I know there are other Yuzumaki still alive and that they are in hiding, because we're too stubborn to die. My admiration for her was beyond what words could ever explain, and her strength to persevere was beyond what any hero or immortal could ever know. Truly she was a demigoddess like no other. As I begin to reminisce the days I spent in my mortal self's memories, I stumbled upon the valley of end, and, in the middle of it, was my son and a teen with a duck ass for a head, wait no, hairstyle. I quickly recognized the teen was in a chihad due to the crest on the back of his shirt, which was torn due to those ugly hand-like wings on his back. I saw my son in the Achiha clash, the latter was knocked back. I smirked to see how powerful my son has grown. I was about to leave until I saw something that made my blood boil, and my wrath skyrocket. Bakashi, my old student, stabbed my son in the back, literally. I quickly made my way to my poison I thought in horror. I pulled out some nectar and gently poured it into my son's mouth while helping him swallow it, since he was unconscious. I could see red energy forming around him. QB, at least the fox was good for something I thought. It seems the QB was easing my son's pain. I couldn't understand why Kakashi would try to kill my son. Did he not know that Naruto is my and Kishina's son? I decided to peer into my son's memories. It wasn't part of my ability, but it wasn't something I couldn't do either, and what I saw made me want to level my mortal self's former village straight into Tartarus. The only reason why I didn't was because of the people who have helped my son, the people of the Red Light District and the people from Kishina and Naruto's, unsurprisingly, favorite Raymond stand, Ichiraku Raymond. This world doesn't deserve my or Kishina's son. I couldn't agree more. I turned around, to my surprise, to see the goddess of the hearth, home, and family. Hestia, I'm surprised to see you here. When did you arrive and did you just agree with me? I asked. I arrived shortly after you did, though I am not surprised to see you here, and the reason I agree with you is because I deduced from your expression and through that mortal's actions that my grandson had lived an unpleasant life. She said. I shared the memories I saw from Naruto with Hestia, and her expression quickly darkened to anger and disgust. Those filthy mortals. She said in rage before turning around to, I assume, level the entire village. I put a stop to that though. Why are you stopping me? She asked. I narrowed my eyes and spoke in a calming tone. Did you not see the people who have helped my son and your grandson? Leveling the village would harm them. Naruto here considers them his surrogate family and precious people. I pointed out which calmed her down. The goddess of hearth took a calming breath. Yes, you are correct. I wouldn't want my grandson to hate me for harming what he considers precious to his heart. Instead I shall place a curse to all those who have harmed him or have ill intent against my grandson. 
their family shall be torn and their homes ruined, and it shall be passed to their children and their children's children, until none of them remain, and with a loud boom her curse was placed. But that said, both goddesses, with Naruto, left the elemental nations through a portal that would take them back to their own dimension. The skies over the elemental nations suddenly darkened. Not long after, it started to rain as if the skies were in tears. The world of Shinobi was never going to be the same again. Avens. The day after Naruto was taken from his world found the blonde inch Kriki resting on a soft bed. The sounds outside the window seemed to wake the blonde. Slowly exposing his piercing cerulean blue eyes, Naruto bolted up and looked around. This place was not his apartment in Konoha. Well, to be frank, he camped in the forest of death, filled with ridiculously large animals and other creature. Strangely, they never once bothered the blonde, nor was it the small clinic in the red light district, since the nurses or doctors form the Kanoha hospital, would either kick him out and not treat him for his injuries, or try to kill him. Looking around the apartment, which looked very expensive and high-end, he noticed a scroll addressed to him. My little maelstrom. I am sorry for what I did to you all those years ago, yes I am the fourth Hokage, but I am also your father, of sorts. My name as you know was mean and amicus. I understand and won't blame you if you hate me, but know that I will always love you. Now, I and your grandmother have taken you away from Kanoha, from the elemental countries even. You are in a nation called the United States, in a place called New York City. Though I am dead as Minato Namikas, I am still alive, but thanks to a certain law I cannot truly really be in your life. Don't worry though, we'll meet in time. That is, if you want to. When the time comes, I will be happy to see you. Now, since you are still young, you have to go to school in this world in a school of your choosing. In the seal at the bottom of the scroll, you will find all that you need in this world, such as books containing the history and language of the world, if you want to learn all the language and history that is, and also money. Oh, just for a reference for the future, read up on Greek mythology, you will need that info, trust me. Be safe my son and remember both your mother and I love you with all our heart. Minanamikas. Naruto was silent for a moment as he finished reading the letter from his technical father, but the blonde strangely didn't find it weird, knowing that there is a certain jutsu that is able to recreate a male reproductive organ, he read Su him, so it wasn't strange to him. For the first time in a long time, tears flowed down from his eyes. They weren't tears of sadness, but happiness. I do have a family Naruto thought. The thought of it was a fantasy for him, to know that your parents didn't abandon you, that they were out there, and that they care. The feeling was too profound to explain, at least to him. Naruto took in some air to relax and calmed himself down. Well kid, looks like you do have a family, but let's do away with that for now. Right now you have a lot of things to do in this new world. A deep voice inside his mind said. Naruto smirked. I know QB, first things first, get all this information into my head, and thanks to my Kage Bunshin Jutsu, I can work on that fast. I will also need to find a way to obtain more money, hopefully there are jobs for someone who can take on an army he thought. And we'll be with you all the way Naruto-sama, a melodic feminine voice, also in his head, said. My sister is correct my lord, though I do hope this world is ready for someone like you, a demonic and bloodthirsty voice said in his head. Naruto smiled and began to laugh in glee. Well, Ma would not have brought me here if she didn't think it wasn't. I will miss my precious people in the leaf, but this place is my new home now, and I actually have a parent and relatives out here. It will take time, but I can get used to this place he said to the voices in his head. Naruto then walked out to the balcony of his new apartment and took in his surroundings and smiled. He then puffed out his chest and took in a deep breath, before he said Naruto Uzumaki Namikas has arrived a ha ha he shouted and laughed happily. In an undisclosed location, somewhere in a South American shipment port. Fox, this is Eagle Eye Confirm Radio Connection. Vixen, this is Fox Radio Connection is confirm. The voice belonging to one Naruto Uzumaki Namikas, who was currently wearing a black stealth nanofiber suite, designed for tactical stealth mission. Good, now I don't need to remind you how important this mission is. Considering who our clients are. A feminine voice said over the earpiece radio. I know. As long as the intel they gave us is good, then you have nothing to worry about, Naruto responded. He summoned three shadow clones and mentally ordered them to arm up. Naruto's weapon of choice was two silenced 5-7 pistols, a silenced ballista PSR, with Nida dual band scope, some grenades, and a bow he affectionately named the Predator Bow. This bow has enough kinetic energy to stop a rhino dead with 20 regular carbon impact arrows. 10 electroshock arrow, when shot at an enemy, electrocute stuns them. Then super thermite arrows, when shot at an enemy or wall or anything for that matter, stick and explode with some splash damage, and 10 airburst fragmentation arrows that will explode upon impact and cause splash damage over a relatively large area. Are you guys prep and ready Naruto asks his clones. 
All his clones nodded, all of them using the same weapon, a silenced Chikam CQB, 3 round burst, bull pup SMG, grenades, and a silenced TAC 45 pistol, and wearing the same cloths the original was currently wearing, aside from the masks they wore. Good, get on the boat and let's move out Naruto ordered. A and I like Call of Duty for its zombie mode and Crisis 3 for, well, the sweet, who doesn't want to wear that nano suite, and multiplayer Xbox and PS player here. I still think it should have been the two of us working on this assignment, not that I don't enjoy a little group action, but I prefer if it is just the two of us, Naruto's partner complained. The blonde could practically see the pout on her face. Well, who better to entertain our guest than you? After all, who's best at handling and working crowds around her fingers like puppets, Naruto heard a scoff, then a hum. You're referring to our last mission in Baltimore. What was it again ah the underground fight arena, yes. Well, what can I say, the crowd loves me, she said with a giggle, letting out a contented sigh at the end. Recalling the mission in Baltimore, Naruto rolled his eyes at her comment. It was to infiltrate the underground fight arena and search for an illegal drug smuggler known for orchestrating illegal underground fights, where kidnapped people are forced to fight for their lives in a fight to the death. Naruto posed as a fighter while his partner was the new announcer, since the last one had a tragic accident, the crowd loved her sunny personality. Well, more like sadistic personality. His partner was known in the business as a bloody sadist, whose reputation earned her, her titles like the Bloody Lady, Red Queen, or the Mad. Remember Naruto, all personnel at the shipment port are to be treated as hostiles and confirm the cargo manifest as indeed illegal weapons. So basically, they don't know what is in the container only that it is valuable. Is this going to be another Mission 32? Naruto asked, recalling one of their contracted missions, which sounded the same. The contents of the Pakage was nothing more than diamonds, not smuggled weapons, though later it became their payment after their employer tried to kill them both. No, this won't be like that mission. The intel report says the cargo of value is to be bought on the market. It could be weapons, the air surveillance photo we got showed how much manpower they have protecting the cargo, was Naruto's partner's response, making the blonde sigh in slight frustration. Fine, but that secondary squad better not be late once the party starts. As good as I am, I can't handle all of the party guests. It's not that Naruto couldn't handle them on his own, but he was not about to underestimate these people. First rule of warfare in combat, never underestimate your enemy, doing so could lead to your death. He's strong, that's for sure, but he wasn't dumb. He's smart and he is cautious, taking into account any and all possible scenarios in the mission. Don't worry Fox, the second squad is on standby and is ready to assist, in case things go to hell. Besides, I personally know from experience that you don't disappoint was her reply. She added a bit of huskiness to her voice, but Naruto knew she was just teasing. Well, your confidence in me helps me relieve some stress, Naruto shot back, eliciting a giggle of amusement from his partner, before turning his attention to his clones, just as they arrived at the south end of the port. Alright, I'll provide watch on top of that crane, while three of you split up in three different directions. The cargo is marked on our hub, and remember, all personnel are to be considered hostile. Naruto stated getting a nod from his clones. Good, let's move out. Naruto quickly climbed, well, more like walked up to the top of the crane and used his chakra to balance himself on top as to not fall to the ground. He wasn't concerned about falling, Naruto just didn't want to be distracted when aiming. It allowed him to have steady aim on a high and ridged position. NC1, you have two hostiles coming your way observing, hold position Naruto said through the mental link he and his clones shared. Naruto watched, through the night enhanced scope, two hostiles packing a Scorpion Evo SMG. Looks like the two of them are separating. Pick your target and I'll take out the other. Naruto watched as his clone went for the second hostile wearing a red jacket, which left him with the first hostile wearing a black jacket. Naruto steadied his breathing and controlled his heart rate. Compensating for gravity and taking into account the wind speed, Naruto fired, hitting the hostile right in the head, and his clone took the second guy out by snapping his neck. NC1, you're close to two of the target containers, confirm cargo Naruto ordered. The Naruto clone found a cargo container and broke the lock. Boss, looks like the intel is spot on. I found a U of attack drone. Checking the second container now. The clone said. Vixen, this is Fox, the first container contains a U of attack drone, checking the second container. There was a bit of silence for a few seconds. Acknowledged, keep me updated. See, told you there was nothing to worry about. Naruto was about to respond until, Boss second cargo contains the drone's missile ordnance. The blonde stopped and frowned. Vixen, the second contains the Yuva's missiles, placing a tag. I placed a tag, have the secondary team ready so they can. Sorry my foxy friend but no, that area has been designated a dead zone, destroy the weapons. Meaning feel free to blow it all up, his partner said with glee in her voice, cutting him off. 
NC-1, placed the explosion tags on both the UAV and the missiles. The clone did so and planted the explosion sealed tags on both weapons. Naruto then turned his attention back to his other clones. Boss, I'm inside the warehouse shipment office, and I found several backlisted shipment orders, advise. His second clone said. Um, the warehouse is near the primary cargo. NC-2 you have permission, but make it quick Naruto said before turning to the last clone, who took out another hostile with his gun. The blonde saw three hostiles heading towards his third clone. NC-3, three hostiles are heading your way, hide the body and prepare to take them. The clone hid the body while the original lined up his shot. Naruto followed one of the guards. From what he observed, it looked like the guy was about to take a piss. Last one you'll ever take the blonde thought when he fired. The two guards heard the thud and turned around. Their shocked state was all that the clone needed to kill them. NC-3, check the cargo now while you're still clear. As Naruto said that, another hostile turned up around a corner. Shit Naruto cursed and had no other choice but to fire, missing the target. The bullet hit one of the cargo containers, alerting the clone. The clone turned around and quickly fired. That was close boss. Naruto agreed and shook his head. The blonde didn't like using guns and preferred to use his blades or his bow. Though his partner would beg to differ, but Naruto's argument with her is you don't need to reload and give your enemy time to kill you or delay yourself in battle, and you couldn't reuse bullets, and you worry about how many magazines you have left. Naruto's partner would be stubborn about it, and the blonde dropped it. Arguing with the opposite sex was far too troublesome and a headache, though he could see the logic and the use of using guns, though it wasn't his cup of tea. NC3, report on your findings. Naruto didn't receive a response, there was a moment of pause, making the blonde narrow his eyes at the lack of a response. NC3, report Naruto pressed. NC3 pav. The boss gave the signal to move out, and we split in three other directions, while boss took the elevated position to provide cover fire. I took to the right side while my fellow clone, NC1, took to the left, and NC2 took to the middle, heading towards the warehouse. This wasn't the first time the boss made use of us clones, usually it was him and her, his handler and partner for missions or contracts. During the first three weeks the boss stayed in New York, he was trying to find a job. He found some here and there, but it didn't sweet his lifestyle or his profession, it felt like another endless D-rank mission. Though there was one mission he didn't complain about, it was when the boss took a job as a delivery boy. The boss made use of his skills, in this word it is called Parker, to deliver packages or, on occasion, food. One delivery I recall was in this high-class looking apartment to a woman the boss felt lost for words for. She had long black hair with silver tips, brilliant green eyes, and a smile that gives the word radiant meaning. But what the boss noted most of all was her warm comforting personality, and her wise traits that the boss had never seen or felt before. Another thing the boss noted was her motherly aura, something the boss yearned for, and it simply made him feel like a child who looked lost and wanted his mother to hold him, along with a sense of familiarity towards her. And it seems the woman sensed this in the boss. She invited him in and had a talk with the boss, the next thing the boss knew he was telling her about his past, how he was kicked out of the orphanage, how the people would hurt him, but he didn't tell her about him being a shinobi, since he didn't want her to think he was crazy. The walls he built around himself simply crumbled beneath her warm aura, the next thing the boss knew he was being hugged, and words of comfort were being whispered into his ear. It felt so alien to him, being hugged like this, and it made the boss think. Was this what it is like to have a mother? Was this the warmth only a mother could provide? He didn't know because he was in tears as she told him to let those built-up emotions go. Since then, every now and then, the blonde would visit the kind woman, Ray, and the boss would honestly drop the mask he wore and be himself, or rather, be someone he didn't think he could, someone normal, someone who didn't have to worry about the world around him. He could be childish, smile a true smile and laugh happily. Currently there are only two people in this world that Naruto would not wear his mask around and simply relaxed with, Ray and his partner. Ah yes, the boss's partner, she had some weird energy in her. Almost like Chakra, though at the same time it wasn't. The boss first met her while he was looking for something more suited for his skills as a trained soldier or a living weapon. He had been getting restless. It wasn't until he overheard some people arguing. What caught boss's attention was that the guys were complaining about how difficult the mission was that the woman had picked for them. Long story short, the guys quit and the boss had a talk with his new handler and partner. The best way to describe their line of work was that both she and the boss are mercenaries. But, unlike mercenaries, they aren't hired. No, they take missions, called contracts, from a guild. The boss could easily compare the contracts to the missions of Konoha. Unlike Konoha, they choose the contracts and, at most, the boss's partner would pick the high-level missions. If, say, there was a way of comparing the level of difficulty of the mission, it could be compared to the levels of missions back in the elemental nations, S rank being the highest and D rank being the lowest. 
The missions the boss's partner would pick our air anchor close to S rank. It was eight months into the job when a certain incident forced Naruto to reveal his abilities, mission 32. Again, long story short, she wanted to know just how and what could cause a massive wall to suddenly shoot up out of the ground and block a hail of bullets, then how could said wall create spears to impale their former employer. The boss admitted it, since by now he had come to trust her. This was also the first time the boss used any sort of jutsu in this dimension. Boss didn't see the need to use any jutsu against people of this dimension or on missions. That and he didn't want to attract unwanted attention. Besides, he could still use his other skills or the ones he had learned to accomplish missions without the need to use jutsu or chakra. After that event, the boss's partner took up more and more dangerous missions. Currently, the mission was search and destroy. As I'm used on that, I saw two guards taking a smoke break. I quickly disposed of the two guards and quickly made my way to one of the cargo containers where another guard was sitting down reading a poor magazine. Well, I hope he liked what he saw because it was the last thing he'll ever see before I put him down. I then heard the boss say three guards were heading my way and ordered me to hide the body. I quickly did so and waited. I didn't have to wait long as one of the guards separated from the other two. Not long after that there was a subtle thud, alerting the two guards. I capitalized on their shock and quickly fired, killing off both guards. I got out of my hiding spot when all of a sudden, I heard a metal clang behind me. I turned around to see another guard and fired, hitting the guy in the chest area. I joked with the boss on how close the encounter was. I heard him grumble, agreeing with my statement. He then ordered me to check the cargo container. I found said cargo and opened it up and what I found almost made me dispel from disgust. Normal pov. Boss oh damn it the clone sounded disgusted, understandable, since his clones would sometimes develop their own emotions or personalities. Most of the time it was his masks that would be usual personas. Boss, this cargo container, it doesn't have weapons but the clone paused yet again. What is it then? Bodies, dead female bodies. Their organs have been removed and they have been raped, judging from the fluids coming out of their vaginal areas, but I don't know if it's before their organs were removed or after boss. Naruto was silent, his eyes were overshadowed by his bangs. Memories of a certain mission back in the elemental nations came flooding back to his mind, and the blonde had to bite down on his lips, drawing blood, to calm himself down. Vixen, this is Fox. The third container does not contain weapons, but the remains of unknown females. All their organs harvested and raped. From what my subordinate told me, he's not sure if it's before or after their organs were harvested. Naruto said, his voice sounding a bit on edge. Wah well, what, Naruto's partner sounded dumbfounded at what she had heard. You heard me. Ask our employer if they knew about it. Naruto all but shouted. He quickly realized his emotions were rising up. The blonde took in some air and pushed those memories of that particular event back, he couldn't afford to let his emotions go wild now. Pox, our employer didn't have prior knowledge of this, but they at least the families of these unfortunate women would have some closure. NC3, place a marker on the cargo containing bodies and any others you can find. NC2, report on your findings. Naruto ordered his third clone before turning his attention to his second clone. NC2 Pov. Once I was separated from the boss and my fellow clones, I headed straight for the warehouse, I treaded carefully and avoided the cameras. At least they have some sort of security. I got on top of one of the containers and saw two guards patrolling the area and another two guarding the entrance. I observed and timed their movements, awaiting the perfect time to make my move. 20 seconds, that was my time frame. I quickly threw a screw to attract one of the guards' attention, but to my slight surprise and delight, both of them decided to check what the noise was. Once they were behind the container I fired, killing them both. I saw the two patrolling guards making their way back to the warehouse entrance. I could see both of them looking around, trying to figure out where the other two had gone. Once they stared back at each other I dropped the first guy and then used the momentary shock to kill the last guy before entering the warehouse. I could sense there was only a single guard in the warehouse, making me think how lax the security is. It must have been because they were confident that no one knew about their operation and so forth. But if there is something true about this life, it's that secrets have a way of revealing themselves. One way or another you can't keep a secret forever and if you could, congrats, but it would always cost something to keep such a secret well secret. Silently, I made my way to the office, mindful to avoid any cameras or other sensors, and I soon reached my destination. I saw the guard looking over some sheets of paper extensively. Curious, I slowly crept up behind him and snapped his neck. I checked to see the contents of the paper and found delivery orders that were blacklisted and were to be sent to a private owner. I informed the boss and asked if I should check on the contents of the cargo, there was a bit of silence before I received permission, so long as I make it quick. I checked the first and closest blacklisted cargo's contents. 
I was shocked and about to call the boss, but he called in and sounded very agitated. Normal Pav. Boss I was about to contact you. The cargo that was blacklisted, there are women in here. From what they told me, the women they capture are to be sold off in auctions, and the unlucky few, their organs are to be harvested. Boss, some of these women are traumatized, and some if not all of them were raped the clone said. Naruto sighed in a bit of relief. At least there were some who are still alive. Vixen, my subordinate found those other missing women, and they are alive. Have our employer prepare a medical team Naruto said. Pox, a medical team is being prepared, now continue wait. Incoming reports from the second team say a chopper is coming in. Indeed Naruto could hear the sounds of a helicopter heading for the west side of the port. The blonde then unsealed a camera designed to take long-range shots. The helicopter landed and a man stepped out along with five bodyguards. The man had tan skin, black eyes and brown hair, and was wearing a dark blue shirt and cargo pants. Over it was mesh body armor. Taking photos now sending, Naruto said taking the photos of the man before he sent it back to his partner for profiling. Hawks, the person's name is Alexander Amir. Wanted on multiple accounts of trafficking, extortion, selling illegal weapons, and is known to have connections to a known terrorist. Naruto stood up and lowered the level of the restriction seals he placed around his body. He did this for two reasons, one was for training and the second, he knew he could rely too much on his chakra and become too dependent on it. His eyes were closed and he had already conveyed a mental order to his clones. Naruto switched from his sniper rifle to his bow and jumped down, channeling his chakra to the lower part of his body. He used this often back in Kanoha when he stood on the Hokage Monument, which could be compared to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, which Naruto guessed was about the same height as the Hokage Monument. The blonde inch Kriki opened his eyes, revealing not his piercing cerulean blue eyes, but a pair of cold crimson red slitted eyes. He wore an unreadable expression, almost void of any emotion. Almost. The only emotion spotted was that of pure bloodlust, anger, and pain. The two former emotions were understandable. But the latter was something from his past, something that still pained him to no end. It was a pain that couldn't be healed or even ignored. I hate that memory. But I can't dwell on the past now. Right now, it's time to hunt. Naruto leaped from one cargo container to the other, while his bow was at the ready. There. The former elemental nation shinobi spotted one guard and fired an arrow with a medium drawn weight. The guard turned around just in time to be impaled in the head by the arrow. The blonde retrieved the arrow and maneuvered from one container to another. He spotted two guards near the fence. Jumping down, he took down the first guy, before kneeing the second guy in the face, causing the back of his head to hit the metal fence. Then C1, is the trap set Naruto asked as he leaped over the fence, making his way towards his target. The blonde inch Kriki counted at least 30 enemies, including the designated target and his bodyguards. The trap is set boss, me and NC3 are waiting on you the clone answered. Dixon, tell the second team that the party is about to start. Make sure they have their party suites on. They are all set and ready, waiting on you fox. Oh, and give them hell for me with you, love. Naruto allowed a smirk, albeit a sadistic smirk, to grace his lips. Sure. Naruto saw one of his clones. He handed the clone the sniper rifle, while he made his way to the target. The blonde gave the clone the signal, and, not a second later, a loud explosion was heard, followed by another, even louder, explosion, sending a shock wave. Normally this would dispel Naruto's clone had the blonde shinobi not reinforced them with a lot more chakra. The second team entered from the front gate, and Naruto's clones provided some cover fire. A firefight was raging on, and the blonde was using the fight as a distraction to slip past the enemy line to capture the target. Naruto stopped when he saw Alexander making his way to the chopper. Oh no, you don't you fuck. Naruto switched his normal arrow to an airburst fragmentation arrow and shot the pilot. The helicopter exploded, not a Hollywood movie explosion, but an explosion nonetheless. Alexander was thrown back slightly and shouted to get him out of there. He got in a black Hummer SUV that he probably got from one of the cargo containers and drove off. Naruto sprinted to cut him off before Alexander could escape. Jumping from platform to platform, container to container, Naruto's movements never wavered. He moved with such grace and speed that you would only see a yellow blur. Alexander saw a blonde with a bow standing between him and his freedom and ordered his guards to run him down, like that deer he killed. Naruto drew back his bow with a strong drawn weight for high damage and long range, though the downside was its drawing time. The arrow pierced the air as it flew towards its target and the unlucky individual was the driver. The car swerved out of control, causing it to flip over. Naruto simply sidestepped in the SUV crash. The blonde switched to his pistol and fired at the guards who were attempting to get out of the downed SUV. Seeing Alexander limping away, Naruto fired at his legs, causing the man to scream out in pain. It's over Alexander, time for you to answer for your crimes. 
That was the lasting thing Alexander heard before he felt something hit the side of his head, knocking him out. Naruto carried Alexander's body over his left shoulder and made his way back to the waiting soldiers. One of the soldiers saw a blonde with a body over his shoulder and alerted the others. That must be him, the one the CIA hired, one of them said. They stood in attention and flinched when they saw Naruto's cold, expressionless face. Here's your trash, the blonde said in a monotone voice, before he harshly dropped the body of Alexander. Boss, these women, they need medical attention quickly, one of his clones called out. Instantly, Naruto softened his gaze and turned around to the group of women, who looked scared, hurt, and traumatized. Naruto slowly walked towards them and noticed them flinch in fear. He knew why. It's alright. We are not going to hurt any of you. A medical team is on its way to treat your injuries and ailment. Afterwards, we are going to return you to your loved ones, he said with a soothing voice, which seemed to work. Naruto heard a choir of sighs and saw them smile. For them, the nightmare is over. Vixen, all mission objectives have been accomplished. Naruto arrived at the hotel he and his partner were staying in for the evening, before heading back to New York City. The time was around midnight and the moon was at its fullest, normally this would lighten Naruto's mood as it always did in the past. But this was not the case, having been reminded of that particular day, his mood was especially sour. He hated remembering that day, or rather that mission back in the elemental nations, though it did give him a chance to meet someone who he later fell in love with. Surprising, since the blonde-haired teen's outlook on love is severely lacking. He didn't know what love is, so he could only describe the feelings as an intense feeling that arose from the sea of his being. It was something unknown to him and it would always plague him, till he read a book regarding love. So he could say he was in love, but at the same time he couldn't say he was only in love with just her. There was another person that held a string to his heart, someone who suffered similar to his past treatment. In his mind, and according to the book he read, he could love more than one person and could be in a relationship with them. But it was to be their choice, not his, and if he were to add then they would have to approve. Oh, and the book was on polygamy. Naruto truly cared about both of them, beyond the similarities of their past experience of being alone and hated for something beyond their control. It was their attitude, their character, and simply being themselves that attracted Naruto to these two women. He felt strong connections to them, though is not two anymore. He also felt lingering feelings for his partner and, unbeknownst to him, his partner had similar feelings, if not much stronger. Again, Naruto lived a life full of hate and grew up with prostitutes, criminals, and people who, like him, were undesirable by society, so his outlook and denseness came with good reason. Walking up to the room Naruto, unlocked the door with his key and stepped inside. He was greeted by a sight that would make any pervert or crude male blush with a nosebleed from the sheer sexiness of it all. Welcome back, my cute little fox, spoke a woman, sounding as seductive as ever. This was none other than Naruto's partner, who just got out of the shower, water dripping down her creamy white skin with only a small towel covering her lower body, and another towel simply draped over her rather large F-cup breasts. Her teal green eyes held a glint of mischief as she slowly turned around, showing Naruto her round plump posterior, while she dried her dark brown hair. If Naruto was any lesser man, then he would have jumped her right then and there, but his partner knew that. Naruto would never press on something unless she allowed it, which was why she was comfortable being around him naked. Well, maybe it was the fact that he grew up in a brothel, he wasn't unfamiliar with seeing naked women. He didn't feel anything about seeing a naked, sexy, and beautiful woman in all her glory. At first she felt ejected, as she thought Naruto thought of her in the norm. It wasn't until she caught Naruto looking at her one time. The brown-haired beauty noticed that it was less lustful and more appreciative, like she was a piece of fine art. She later found that her partner appreciated her, not just because of her beauty. He liked her simply for being her and because she wouldn't change to the wants or expectations of society. Moxie, good evening, Naruto greeted with a tiredly with a slight emotional edge, which Moxie caught. The blonde removed his clothing, leaving him in only his boxers and laid down on the bed that he and Moxie shared. Madeline Mox, or Mad Moxie, could be summed up with a few words, sadistic, alluring, dangerous, and lustful. Well, only towards a certain blonde. She enjoys violence and combat, being skilled with hand-to-hand -hand combat and weaponry, she taught Naruto how to handle and use a gun after all. Modesty has little to nothing to do with Moxie, but she is very refined with her tastes, mannerisms and attitude. Despite her violent tastes, she is also friendly and rather compassionate when fighting is not involved, though only Naruto has ever seen this caring side of her. Most people only see the bloody queen people associate her with. Naruto, tell me, what's wrong? Naruto had to blink once to make sure he wasn't seeing things. Moxie was surprisingly on top of him, and he hadn't even noticed her move. Sighing slightly, Naruto arched into a sitting position, leaning on the headboard. The mission just brought up some unpleasant memories from my old world, he said, dropping his psychological mask. 
Not many people get to see Naruto without his mask, it was either the goofy, energetic, brash, and spontaneous mask, or it was his cold, tactical, calm, and overall emotionless mask. Since coming to this world, Naruto normally wore the latter. Naruto made these masks to cope with the harsh treatment in Konoha. He hid his damaged emotional state, as well as the despair he felt growing up. For all his strength, all his power, Naruto was still that scared, miserable, and pain child who just wanted to be accepted as someone other than a plague, an abomination, a monster. Moxie wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck and laid his head on her breasts in a warm and comforting embrace. She knew about her partner's past, and she saw the scars around his otherwise flawless body. Moxie couldn't fathom the sheer stupidity or her disgust of the people from her Naruto's former village. She would have loved nothing more than to butcher, maim, torture, and kill those people in the most heinous ways possible. This was also the reason why Moxie greatly admired Naruto. The things he endured would have driven anyone insane and made them hateful towards the world. But he pushed through it, coming out as the strong, kind, and caring individual that Moxie had come to know and care for. But she knew he was still damaged, and the wounds were still there, the quote time heals all wounds could not be associated with Naruto's, and the scars only prove that. Moxie felt a familiar warm, wet droplet of tears going down on her breasts, causing her to bring him closer to her, whispering comforting words to him. It was a minute in when she noticed Naruto had stopped crying, now sleep. Sleep well, my little fox. She thought as she lay next to him. Inside Naruto Mindscape. Naruto opened his eyes and found himself in a familiar place, his mindscape. In front of him were large golden bars and red crimson eyes staring back at him. Hugh B. Naruto greeted as he slowly stood up and looked to his surroundings, as if he was looking for something, or rather someone. Come out you two. He said ordered. Out from the shadows of his mindscape, two individuals came out. The first was a beautiful woman, with long braided blonde hair with a blue bow, pale white skin, and a white cloth covering her DD cup breasts under a semi-transparent sheet. She also wore a semi-transparent miniskirt over her white panties, a white cloth over her feet, a cloth on her left arm and a gold bracelet on her right wrist. On her head, she wore gold and a glass helmet with a four-wing design and a diamond, she also had two long sparkling wings on her back. The second individual was a living inferno of a being with metallic feet, shin guards, armor, gauntlets, and metallic skull heads. Unlike the woman, who radiated warmth and love, this being was pure malice incarnate, simply screaming, bloodlust personified. Elysium, Inferno. Naruto greeted the two sentient spirits, who kneeled in response, making the blonde slightly groan at their habit. He had told them there was no need for them to do such formal things, him hating formal things like kneeling or referring to him as Sama or Lord being an example, though, by now, Naruto had gotten used to them doing such things. Naruto-sama, we have sensed your emotional distress. What can we do to help, Elysium asked, ever faithful as the day Naruto found both their sword forms. It's nothing Elysium, the mission brought up unwanted memories from my past. But let us do away with that. Right now I need to further progress with my training, especially for that, Naruto said. The three beings inside his head perked up at this. So, you have yet to master that yet you want to add mastering my chat. I know Kurumi, and would you turn to your human or semi-human form, Naruto said. In an instant the QB vanished and was replaced with a woman with long flowing red-orange hair, reaching down to her perky butt, G-size breasts, caramel skin, a perfect hergless figure, three defined whiskers on both sides of her face, red slitted eyes, fox ears, and nine flowing tails. She wore a blood-red form-fitted kimono with a black flowering design, modified to reach down to her upper knees and loose, giving a view of her breasts and a neck choker with a kanji seal around her neck. My, my so much stress Narukun, should I assume you requested me to change to my human form to relive it? Then by all means, come inside my cage and let me do so, QP purred. But then she found herself bound in chains wrapping around her body in the most erotic way possible. I have no time for such games QP I am already angered as it is, I don't need nor want your antics to further such. Naruto emphasized by tightening the chains around Kurumi's body, making her grunt in slight pain and pleasure. With a snap of the fingers the chains vanished. So aggressive, though I do love aggression, Cuckoo QP said, giggling at the last part, but stopped when she heard a growl of annoyance from her ginch cricky. Fine, fine change this play so we may begin. With another snap, Naruto's mindscape changed from the deceptive sower to the luscious forest of training ground 44, otherwise known as the forest of death, Naruto's regular training place, and where he spent the vast majority of his life in. The forest of death is considered in Konoha to be a danger zone because of the large creatures, such as animals, insect, and monstrosities that call this place their home. That is why it was sealed off from the population, even during the Chunin exams, where this place was used to hold the second part of the exam. A section of the forest was used for this particular event. 
Naruto on the other hand called this place his actual home, his second home being Lilith's main brothel house. None of the residents of the forest ever bothered him, and the blonde assumed it was because of Kurumi or something else, either way it made a great place to train in secret. Now, let us begin, shall we, Naruto said, summoning two dual connecting scythes, while both Elysium and Inferno summoned their sword forms. Inferno's sword was crystalline in structure with a crimson hue, but with a trace of black and, from what Naruto could tell, flesh in the interior. The blade itself was small and slim, a wing-shaped handguard and a skill-like form in the middle, with an eye situated just above it. Elysium's sword was sleek in appearance with a crystalline, ice-like design, a handguard that resembled a feminine face with a blue crystal, situated just above it, and as slim as the Inferno's blade. From what Naruto could see from the blade itself, it had some kind of symbols that he couldn't distinguish or even read. Inferno was first to charge in. Naruto, anticipating this, jumped back. Both sentient spirits had a rather unique ability to them. Inferno's ability grants its user incredible strength to give an edge. In some cases, it can penetrate through defenses as well, chipping away health. The only drawback is the parasitic ability that drains the user's health, which was why the user would have to adapt to an almost defensive style. But with Elysium, whose ability can regenerate a user's health at the same rate as Inferno's ability to drain health, along with boosting a grand amount of physical strength, meaning the user's stamina. While she may not be as powerful in terms of attack power, she is still as effective as her brother, since the two balance each other for their wielder. That is why Naruto distanced himself from Inferno. Naruto could not afford to clash with him at close range, opting for long range. Channeling his chakra into both his sides, Naruto sent several, dark blue crescent-shaped waves, which Inferno blocked with his sword, before getting kicked back by his wielder. Naruto then quickly dodged an attack from Elysium. The blonde knew any attack against Elysium would all be ineffective because of her defensive capability, and Naruto had to clash with her with more powerful attacks, which was contradicting to his normal style, but he had learned to adapt. Connecting his scythes together, the blonde clashed blades with his fellow blonde, causing her to grunt a bit at the force of the attack. She jumped backwards when she noticed her wielder disconnecting his scythes. That was the advantage of dual connecting scythes. Even if the opponent blocked the first one, the second was sure to follow, and her wielder had mastered how to use this weapon to its full potential. She wasn't surprised when both her and her brother's sword forms were changed to fit his combat style. Both their appearances are similar to each other save the color, Inferno's being crimson red and Elysium's crystal blue, their respective facial appearance on the guard or heel of the side and their distinct features. Naruto dodged as a crimson wave came seconds from harming him. The blonde blocked Inferno's next attack. His left eye twitched when he felt his strength being drained. Using the force of the attack, Naruto leaned back, changing his center of gravity, then side stepped to the left, causing Inferno to lose his footing and stumble forward. Inferno felt the cold unforgiving steel of his lord's side, signaling that he had The blonde was slightly surprised when he saw Elysium. Time slowed down. Seeing her blade descend, Naruto reversed his grip on his side and struck Elysium's sword hard at its guard, causing her to lose her grip on the sword, which flew into the air. She too felt her wielder's blade on her neck, signaling that she had lost. It seems we have lost brother. It would seem so sister. They both said as Naruto removed his scythe from their neck by slicing their heads off. In one motion Naruto spun around with his scythe close to their necks, Elysium's head fell to the ground while Inferno's blood gushed out from his neck. Their bodies fell down with a thud and their blood flowed like a river. Naruto panted before ordering, reform. There was a bright light and the two sentient beings were back, healthy and alive. Both of them won't die or fade away, since they're not part of the natural order of things. Harsh as ever, my lord, Inferno commented with a bloodthirsty grin. It's combat, if I gave my opponent a chance to surrender they would have a chance to kill me, he said logically. Inferno boomed in laughter. Only in combat, only in the battlefield will he ever see such a harsh side of his master. I suppose so my lord, he said. Naruto sent an apologetic look to Elysium, who raised a hand. I understand my lord and it matters not to me, so no need to apologize, though I appreciate the gesture, she said, seeing the kind part of her master. How long till you regain your yin side, Naruto asked, referring to the yin side that his technical father sealed within her body, which Naruto retrieved from the corpse. It shouldn't be long now before my yin side is fully restored and we can finally start with you mastering my chakra. Give it a month or so, she informed. Naruto nodded and sat down. You know, I could still help you relieve stress, Kurumi said seductively, wrapping her arms around Naruto's neck, her nine tails around his body, with her soft yet firm breasts pushing up against his back. It wouldn't be the first time and I don't need to mess with your emotions to do so, she said as she turned his head to face her and kissed him passionately. Naruto and Kurumi have a strange kind of relationship. 
They would have sex, but they weren't a couple or even friends. It was either him or QB that initiated, Kurumi more so than Naruto, so Naruto was confused, or rather he was dense. Kurumi had developed feelings for the blonde as he grew up. At first, she denied or shot down such thoughts, him being her jailer and all. But as time passed she slowly came to realize that her feelings for Naruto and knew she couldn't deny it. Her instincts roared at her, telling her that he is her destined mate. She desired all of it, his darkness, his warmth, his coldness, that ever-present determination and that sheer aura of dominance. Everything screamed perfect mate in her opinion, or rather, her instincts. Like a moth to fire, Kurumi felt drawn towards him and knew she couldn't get away. Kurumi could go on and on about what she loved about Naruto, like his determination, his strength, that unwavering will to push forward even when everything around him wants him dead. Naruto didn't stop and pushed through with perseverance without succumbing to his darkness. On the contrary, he accepted it and used it to fuel his want to become strong, and the result was the person she was currently kissing. Oh Naruto, if you weren't so dense you would know how much I love you, like that partner of yours or even those two women you came to care for. After all, who knows you better than I do she thought. She moaned when she felt Naruto's hand caressing one of her tails. It should also be noted that Naruto didn't blame her for the death of his parents, even when he knew who the cause of it was. He still didn't blame her. The phrase he used could be similar to you don't blame the gun for the person who fired it. But now, he is in this world. Naruto was forced to let go of revenge, which was difficult, since it was part of the reason he trained to the point of death. Now he is looking for a new goal, and QB hoped he would find one. Behind the two, Elysium glared at QB for such provocation and perverse actions. Inferno, on the other hand, was watching with popcorn and soda that he found somewhere. This should be good. What was the current record, ah? 16 hours of non-stop rutting like bunnies in heat, and that was the first round he thought. Naruto broke off the kiss, much to QB and Inferno's disappointment with the latter much more vocal, getting a smack from his sister and the former inwardly groaning in displeasure. I'm too tired Kurumi, mentally and spiritually. Some other time, I promise. He said, giving her a reassuring smile. One of the things Lilith taught him, aside from how to please a woman, was that a gentleman doesn't leave a woman displeased or unsatisfied, but Naruto was too tired, and his emotions had yet to calm down. Fine, next time I expect you to be an animal, QB said with a slight huff, though she understood why. Naruto felt his consciousness leaving his mindscape. Knowing he was about to leave, he gave Kurumi a breathless kiss, making her shudder in delight. Before she could return the gesture, Naruto vanished. You know, there are other ways for cheering someone up, QB, Elysium said still maintaining her cold glare. The nine-tailed fox merely waved her off with her right hand in a shooing motion. I know, you virgin prude, but it would be less pleasurable and more boring. Besides, do you honestly expect me to know how to deal with human emotion, well half-human, but that is beside the point, and can you really blame me? After all I am a yaokai, or am I an inari, and by the species that the sage made me from, I am a lustful being, she said with no shame, though she knew other ways of cheering Naruto up, she knew, and would argue that sex would be much more effective. Inferno sighed as he tried to cover his ears as the two women began to argue, and hoped that they would stop soon, which he knew they wouldn't. Women are troublesome that way in his opinion. Outside of Naruto's mindscape. Naruto woke up and expected weight on his chest. Instead, he found himself looking up at the ceiling of his apartment in New York. My clone must have summoned me. Better email Moxie Naruto thought before proceeding to do just that. The seal Naruto developed was based off of the summoning scroll and intensive research on summoning in general, while he was back in the elemental nations. After countless experiments, some ending in failure and causing extensive damage to the test subject he used, which were either his clone or fruit, he was finally able to recreate the way to summon, similar to summoning an animal from a summoning scroll. He cleaned himself up since today was his school's field trip to a museum. As he went into the bathroom, his phone rang. Sighing a bit, Naruto answered the phone, knowing full well who was at the other line. Morning Naruto. I got your message, though I'm slightly irked that my morning pillow and the warmth it provides was missing. I let it slide as soon as you use that technique the Mistress of Blood said, referring to his jutsu. Can I do it after I shower? Oh, that's even better. Hurry up and use that technique of yours so I can join you. Sighing again, Naruto didn't have the energy or the will to argue with her. Left with no other option, Naruto reverse summoned his partner. Hopefully she remembered to bring her bags this time the blonde thought, recalling the first time he used this technique with her. There was a familiar poof sound, and the smoke cleared, revealing Moxie, naked as the day she was born with her numerous luggage behind her. Well, shall we, my cute little fox, she chirped, grabbing Naruto by the wrist and dragging him to the bathroom. Moxie, no sex, and don't give me that look. I have a trip to go on. Again, don't give me that look. We'll have sex later, okay? 
Naruto's voice echoed through the room. Moxie, that is not my back. Well, your log doesn't seem to mind. Ugh, why do I put up with you again? Many reasons, my cute little fox. One of them is sex. Second is that I'm your handler, and third, well, sex. Your honesty soothes my heart. I'm getting in the tub. Oh, it's warm. Just the way I like it. Inside the bathroom, both Naruto and Moxie relaxed in the bathtub, with Moxie on top of Naruto, and said blonde's arms around her breasts in private area. Now ain't this relaxing, though I digress, we could do a more effective form of stress relief, she said, while shaking her hip slightly on Naruto's tool. The blonde chuckled slightly and shook his head. His partner was annoying sometimes, but he knew she meant well. Yeah that would be nice, but my mood is still sour Mox, he said, looking up with a rather solemn look. I took note of the mission and noticed that there is a similarity between this mission and one of the missions you told me from your world. I'm guessing it is that mission that involved her correct. Moxie's answer came with an affirmative nod from her blonde partner and love interest. The brown-haired beauty knew how much it stung the blonde and how painful it was for him. Moxie turned her body around and wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck and brought him close into a hug. It wasn't your fault Naruto and you know she wouldn't want you to grieve like this. She would have wanted you to move on, she said softly. Naruto nodded into her breasts. Yeah you're right, she's that kind of person. I just wish I could have done more. No, I know I could, but I was too no I can't even say that sigh thank you Moxie, he simply said, though Naruto's companion knew he was still hurting and it would take time for him to get over his funk. Until then, she would remain by his side. Anytime love, anytime. After a while, the two got out of the bathroom and got dressed. Naruto was wearing a black long-sleeved polo, jeans, and converse shoes. Moxie wore a black corset overlapped by a leather jacket, leather jeans and thigh-high boots, which were modified with a hidden blade. You sure you want to go with me, it might get boring, Naruto said, since visiting a museum wasn't what Moxie would normally like to do or even consider doing. Moxie responded by playfully poking Naruto's forehead. I am, besides, like you, I have this curiosity about Greek history, she said, wrapping her arms around Naruto's right arm as they left the building and got in Naruto's Bentley GTC convertible. It's a good thing that there is no traffic today, cause traffic in New York, damn. So tell me about this school of yours. Not much to tell really, Yancey Academy is a simple private boarding school teaching subjects such as pre-algebra, English, and Latin. Most of the students are troubled kids, like this one kid I know, Perkins no wait Peter no Hama Percy. Yes that's his name. It seems he has the same symptoms that we have. You mean dyslexic and ADHD. Yes, though I do feel some weird energy similar to yours but very different, and his friend, um Gordon, no Gaby maybe Grover that's his name, though he smells of goat and Percy smells like the ocean. Oh and what do I smell like? Fresh rosemary and honey. How accurate, to lust foods, fufu. -fu. Naruto chuckled. It's true though. From what the blonde knew about food, those two are considered part of the twelve lust foods, and he found it odd that his partner has this scent on her. Well anyways, not all students are troubled kids. Some students are from well-off rich families, meaning most of them are spoiled brats, he said, turning the next corner and seeing the school bus. The students and the two teachers stopped whatever they were doing and saw the school's student council president and head disciplinary committee car park. All the female population blushed at the sight of Naruto, and the males also blushed when they saw Moxie, especially the cloth she wore. Naruto scanned his surroundings, and his eyes landed on a certain wheelchair teacher. Hmm, a concealment technique Naruto thought, recalling how suspiciously Mr. Brunner came to be employed at the school. An old crow named Mrs. Dodds had the same concealment technique around her making them both targets until proven otherwise. Hmm, Mr. Brunner smells of a horse's ass, and Mrs. Dodd smells of decay. If they do prove to be hostiles, then I'll have to eliminate them the blonde thought before hooking his arm around Moxie, making the people think they were both a couple. Many of the students quickly quieted down and remained where they were, lest they want to suffer the blonde's wrath and severe punishment. But unfortunately, some students have yet to notice the blonde. Naruto saw some food being thrown at a crippled kid who the former Leaf Shinobi identified as Grover Underwood. I'm not in the mood for this he thought and, in a blink of an eye, Naruto pulled Grover back, avoiding the wads of peanut butter and jelly. Naruto turned his gaze to who both threw and wasted perfectly good food. His cold, piercing eyes landed on one Nancy Boba Fett and her friends who froze under the blonde's gaze and started sweating bullets, knowing how screwed they were. Picking up the food from the ground, Naruto made his way towards the school bully and her lackeys, while channeling a bit of Kai, killing intent and concentrating it towards the annoying girl. Once he was in front of them, Nancy and her friends felt like death was staring down on them. Eat it, he said in a cold tone that would freeze the underworld over. BB but she stuttered and shrunk beneath Naruto's gaze. 
The editor Elsie said, and suddenly a demonic mask materialized behind the blonde. Blood was flowing out from its mouth and eyes, while red glowing eyes were looking down on them, as if begging them not to, so it could devour them. Out of fear Nancy shoved the food, which was on the grass, down in one go. Good, next time don't waste food or else, he said with a sickening sweet smile that promised pain. Naruto walked back towards Grover and Percy, both petrified in fear. Underwood, be more mindful of your surrounding and Jackson be more attentive, would you kindly, he said still wearing that sickeningly sweet smile. It didn't help that the demonic mask was still behind him, both teens nodded. Good. And just like that, the mask disappeared as Naruto turned around to leave, until. Um, Naruto. Could I ask you a question, Percy said, mustering enough bravery to do so. Naruto turned his head sideways and nodded. Um, what was that? I mean that demonic mask that was behind you, the sea green-eyed teen asked nervously. The blonde gave him an innocent look that looked all too fake and tilted his head a bit. You must be seeing things, Percy. Is the heat getting to you, do you feel dizzy? Did you not take your morning grains, because I do not know what you are talking about, Naruto answered in a fake innocent tone. Bullshit both teens thought. Well, in any event, you are allowed to eat during the tour, so long as you remember to throw your trash in the proper recycling bin. Now hurry along the tour is about to start. With that said, the enigmatic blonde rejoined his partner. Um and Percy, Grover said while shaking his head. The eye was Percy's response since he wasn't sure if Naruto meant it or not. Naruto hooked his arms around Moxie, who gave him a bloodthirsty and lustful grin. My, you were so dominant there my cute little fox, she whispered in a husky tone, while pressing her impressive bust on his arms. Making me feel hot under the weather, you'd better take responsibility for this later she said. The blonde shook his head and wonder how he puts up with her quirks, but he guessed that that's what he likes about her. It was her quality and her honest personality along with her attitude that he truly liked, and her beauty and sexiness was just a bonus to him. He got used to Moxie's quirks and accepted it. Besides, he wouldn't and won't have her change who she is for anything. Ha ha, maybe. Who knows, he said simply. From the corner of his eyes, Naruto spotted an eight-year-old girl with mousy brown hair. Her eyes held an amount of warmth and care that the blonde had never seen before. A gust of wind caused him to blink, and when he reopened them, the girl was suddenly gone. But he thought before turning his attention to the wheelchaired Latin teacher. Looking around the many statues depicting the Greek gods and goddesses of Olympus, Naruto, for some odd reason, felt a familiar feeling of connection that he only felt with the people who he viewed as his family. He especially felt drawn to one that depicted the goddess, Hestia. Just by looking at the statue, Naruto felt a sense of calm wash over him and felt his growing negative emotions slowly receding, much to his confusion and delight. The smile graced his face, a smile that would normally be seen when he's around his precious people. Who knows, maybe I may be related to them. Shaking his head at the thought, Naruto listened in to the Latin teacher and noticed the class was starting to become noisier. Naruto was about to reprimand them when a comment from a certain annoying girl caused a sea-green-eyed teen to snap and practically yell at Nancy to shut up. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Brunner called out. Said teen looked towards the wheelchaired man. Did you have a comment, he asked. The teen replied with a no, feeling embarrassed by his outburst. Mr. Brunner, it wasn't Jackson's fault, Boba Fett along with some of the class were being noisy, Naruto said in defense of the dark-haired teen, albeit stokely, this got a nod from Mr. Brunner and a thankful look from Percy. But Jackson, leave the reprimanding to me and mind your words, also any more inappropriate noise, and Violator will receive two weeks detention and three days community service. He lectured Percy first, then warned the class. This, of course, got a fearful nod from all the students. Now let us continue. Mr. Jackson, can you tell me about this picture, Mr. Brunner asked, pointing to one of the pictures on Estelle. The picture seemed to incite an emotional sadness from Mr. Brunner when he looked at the female, which Naruto caught. Hmm. The blonde tugged on his partner's shirt, and Moxie knew what he wanted to do. The brown-haired beauty caught onto the flickering emotion from the Latin teacher too. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Percy answered. Yes, Mr. Brunner said, not looking that satisfied. And can you tell me why? Naruto nodded to Moxie to intervene and to get a response from Mr. Brunner. He ate his kids because of a prophecy telling him that his kids were going to kick him down from his pedestal, Moxie explained, getting a sigh of relief from Percy. Ha, hey, if the so-called Titan Lord wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic and didn't get his panties in a bunch, then he wouldn't have eaten his kids, causing the prophecy, thus signing his own death warrant. He screwed himself over because his wife hit her last born, Zeus, and gave the Titan a rock to eat. But I guess he wanted something hard to swallow. She said the last part saucily, implying a double meaning to the last part, getting a lot of people to laugh, including Mr. Brunner. 
Anyway, when Zeus was all grown up, he tricked his dear old daddy into drinking and barfing up his brothers and sisters, you by the way. The female group agreed with her. Of course being immortals and all, they survived and were fully grown, surviving in the titan's stomach all those years. Hmm, I imagine them saying, hey little brother what took you, do you know how boring and how it smelled in there, bah, doesn't matter give us a hug, Moxie joked, making everyone snicker and chuckle. They waged war against their tyrannical father and his cronies, with a help from some cyclops and hecatonkers, or hundred arms for those who don't know. Zeus managed to convince a cyclops by the name of Bronze to forge him and his siblings powerful weapons, such as Zeus's magic glowing stick, Poseidon's massive fork, and a forehead protector for Hades. Now that comment got Mr. Brunner to stiffen with an extremely worried look, but it was quickly gone. Naruto smirked, seeing as he got what he needed, but he only needed one more thing to further prove his theory. Long story short, after 11 years, the Olympians won, with help of course, and Zeus took his dear old daddy's side and sliced Kronos into pieces, before casting him and his followers into Tartarus, with the exception of Atlas, who was forced to hold the sky, Moxie finish, and inwardly grinned as she saw Naruto's smirk, meaning she accomplished her task. Like we're going to use this in real life. Like it's going to say on our job application, please explain why Kronos ate his kids, Nancy mumbled. It was still loud enough for Mr. Brunner to hear. And why, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Yuzumaki, to paraphrase Miss Bobafit's question, does this matter in real life, he said asked the two teens, with the former glaring at the annoying girl, while the latter had an unreadable expression on his face. Busted, Grover said with a slight smirk. Shut up, Nancy Snap barked at Grover, while blushing as red as her hair because of the embarrassment she felt. Naruto decided to speak first to save Percy from embarrassment. Since both Greek and Roman culture have significant impact in modern civilization and society, such as art, science, philosophy, laws, and warfare to name a few, he answered, not really caring, as his mind was racing for a plan to get the teacher alone. Percy sighed as Naruto's answer not only shut Nancy up, but, more importantly, saved him, since he wasn't able to think of an answer. Soon, everyone was outside eating their lunch. But, for some odd reason, the weather outside was starting to storm. Another odd thing, aside from Naruto, Moxie, Grover and Percy, no one seemed to notice. This feels like a Jinjutsu, but on a much higher scale Naruto thought. Then, all of a sudden, the blonde felt a fluctuation of power, making him turn towards where he felt the fluctuation, and saw the water from the fountain rise up and push Nancy on her behind. His eyes widened slightly at that and turned to his partner who nodded confirmation. Percy pushed me, Nancy whined as Mrs. Dodds came right up to the sea green-eyed teen. The blonde's instincts told him to follow the two. He followed them to a secluded part of the museum, and he could hear a small argument between Mrs. Dodds and Percy. Peering through the door, the blonde saw Mrs. Dodds transform into some weird bat-like creature. Before she could attack Percy, Naruto decided to make his presence known. The two were alerted as the doors opened, revealing Naruto. And Naruto, what, run? Percy shouted, but the blonde ignored the teen as his attention was on the humanoid bat that was once Miss Dodds, who looked visibly pale for some odd reason. The blonde saw she was about to escape, but he would have none of that. Blue threads shot out form the blonde's right hand fingertips and wrapped around the monster. Percy, keep this between the two of us, got it, Naruto said, staring into Percy's sea green eyes with his piercing cerulean blue ones. The teen nodded and, with a single tug of the threads, the bat-like creature was sliced into multiple bits, leaving a pool of blood before it vanished into light particles. Percy felt like vomiting, but was able to hold it back. Just then, Nancy walked in. I hope Mrs. Dodds whipped your, but she shut up when she saw Naruto glaring at her. Jackson, I will talk to you later, but for now both you and Boba Fett regroup with the class, now, he said with a cold and commanding tone. The two teens nodded and promptly ran. You can come out now Mr. Brunner, I can sense your horses behind from a mile away, he said. Said Latin teacher wheeled in. Who are you, he asked. That is what I should be asking you. Why are you covered in an illusion, specifically your lower area, he said, while channeling visible Kai and manifesting his Hanyu mask, with black itcher and large centipedes crawling out of its eyes. Mr. Brunner went white at seeing such a horrific sight, but calmed himself down. How did you know, he asked, albeit still frightened. I'm not originally from this dimension, since my father and grandmother brought me here from my dimension, he said. He must be a demigod then Mr. Brunner thought, since only gods and goddesses could possibly go into different dimension. He decided to tell Naruto his identity and the reason why he was here, among other things. So, let me get this straight, your name has Chiron, a centaur, the trainer of heroes and one of the directors, the other being a god, of Camp Half-Blood. 
you are able to hide yourself under the mist, which hides the appearance of any supernatural event from mortals, and the reason you are here is to watch over Percy Jackson, who you suspected to be a demigod child of the big three, Naruto summarized. Yes, you summarized it perfectly Mr. Yuzumaki. Psy Moxie, his story checks out. Don't kill him. Tyrant turned around and saw the brunette was about to stab him with a kunai. Shame, I really wanted to test this new metal we found Naruto, she said. Taking a closer look, Chiron's eyes widened as he recognized that particular metal. Moxie raised a single brow at the shocked look on the centaur. You recognize this metal, she asked. Chiron nodded. Yes, it's called Imperial Gold. A metal that is fatal to immortals and half-blood mortals. How did you acquire it, he asked since, even during ancient times, the metal was very closely guarded. It was a gift, actually. From when I was brought here to this world, Naruto answered. It was true. After Naruto read his mom and grandmother's letter, he found several scrolls containing several weapons that were in his world's likeness. But since he already had his own weapon, the blonde decided to give them to Moxie. Tyron, we'll watch over Jackson for now, since I owe the kid a bit of an explanation from what happened earlier. I know you saw what I did and I'll explain further in the future, but for now let us rejoin the class to avoid suspicion. Chiron nodded at Naruto's words and left. By we, you mean you, right, because I'm not about to babysit a kid. Hell the only missions I don't join are escort and guard missions, Moxie said with a tone that left no room for argument. Naruto rolled his eyes at this but otherwise nodded. Fine, but maintain radio connection, in case something happens. Got it. She nodded. That's it for today guys hope you all enjoyed this video if you do please leave a like share and subscribe. Take care thanks for watching.